A number of years ago, Major General Furlong, whose career as an army officer uh, led him into many parts of the world, became deeply interested in the descent of religions and the various meetings and intermeetings of these streams of spiritual conviction. And he did a series of books dealing with this subject. And in one of them, he includes a very extensive chart which folds many times and becomes a diagram of a great river of beliefs. And he called this chart the River of Faith. And he attempt to explain, attempted to explain by means of this chart descending through history how religions came to the modern world, the backgrounds of what we believe, and the gradual building of the structures of faith which are of concern to all of us. Perhaps the most interesting point that he made uh, has value now. Each person in his own religious life, more or less, lives through this entire chart. Just as the human being coming into birth passes in the fetal and em embryonic states through practically all of the preceding kingdoms of nature before he attains his human structure. So it seems that the human being after birth, in his thinking, in his emotions, in his graspings for con consolation and confidence, goes through subjectively the entire quest of man for spiritual value. Now it is true that each individual is largely influenced by his own tradition, by his own experiences, and by the prevailing creeds and the cultures in which he lives. But these do not provide the entire answer to his spiritual needs. Something must come from his own contemplation of life. And General Furlong was of the conviction that the streams of religion began in man's contemplation, his interior effort to integrate the experiences and processes of his own life in relation to its environment. But through these strivings, he forms his religious conviction. At least by this means, the person approaches religion dynamically. He is not merely an historian of faith. He is not uh, one who simply accepts the dominant cults of his day without question, selects one, and tries to live by it. There is more than this. There is this estimation of need, the individual's own requirement and he searches for something that meets this requirement, having an individuality about his seeking, which we are all permitted to have, but very few of us make much use of it. We are simply willing uh, to drop into a religious niche somewhere, much as we accept on face value most of the other so-called realities of life. So I think General Furlong's position is more or less well taken. Each person who is open-minded and thoughtful begins to experience the needs of faith. Unfortunately for most of us, this experience is not well-oriented. We do not have the necessary personal instruments by which we can seek religious consolation with any perspective, with any uh, certain assistance.
from the available uh, religious sources of mankind. Uh, one answer might be, and I think someday could be given more thought, namely that some basic training in the comparative principles of religion should be included in education. Now, I do not mean creedal religion. I do not mean that education should insist upon any belief, but that it should provide the individual with some comprehension of the beliefs available in order that he may choose more intelligently. I have talked to many persons on the problems of religion, and the majority of persons, particularly in this country, have absolutely no conception of any faith or religion other than that with which they are most immediately familiar. They are not able to even approach comparative religion. Yet without uh, such assistance, it is difficult for a person to make a complete choice of his own believing. He does not know what is available to him. If you were going into a store to buy a dress or a suit, you would probably not be satisfied if the store could offer you only one to choose from. Uh, you would not want to buy your goods where there is no selection possible. You would therefore look for a larger store where perhaps some unsuspected design, pattern, or color might interest you. If the person is perfectly willing to go into a restaurant that serves only one item of diet, fully aware that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday it will be beans, if he is satisfied with this, then he has no essential problem, but we would regard him as somewhat lacking in, uh, shall we say, taste in foods. If this same individual traveling always took the same trip, he would not be in a position to tell where the best scenery is to be found. He can only continue to tell how wonderful the area is which he has explored. If he has never engaged in any thoughtfulness about philosophy, he is scarcely in a position to know what philosophy has to offer him or to weigh the values of different schools in terms of his own requirements. And so we can go down through almost every product in life. The automotive industry would not be nearly so successful if only one color and one style of car was always available. We like to have an opportunity to compare, to examine, and to think. But in our spiritual problem, the only way in which we can achieve this end is by a very dramatic effort of our own. We have to break through a common pattern of inertia and become rugged individualists if we expect to find more than that which is generally offered. Thus, in religion, we have not made use of all of its wonders and its beauties and its possibilities. Also, I think that uh, we are limited to a measure by the fact that most religious groups, in practice, are more or less dogmatic. This is not necessarily true of the better and more informed exponents, but it is true of the majority of a following. This following is devout and comes to the inevitable conclusion that its own selection is the best. Thus, if we live in a community in which there is a common agreement as to what is best, we are not only not inclined uh, to search further, but our efforts to find are hampered or interfered with by prevailing limitations of perspective. 
The study of comparative religion, therefore, is not to be regarded merely as a grubbing through ancient documents uh, for no vital purpose, but rather is a way of showing us what is possible in the form of belief. And also each of these different faiths has its own logic, its own reasonableness, its own traditional support for that which it does believe. Unless we examine the logic, we are again short changing ourselves. We are not supposed merely to believe because we are told to. We are given an opportunity to determine why what we believe is peculiarly necessary to us. If we do not take advantage of this privilege, we again limit our perspective unnecessarily. Major General Furlong also points out another interesting uh, situation that arises, uh, namely that this search for larger perspective, this effort to sort of outgrow a local situation requires an attitude on the part of the believer. He has to have a certain natural inquiry. And as civilization goes on, becoming ever more defensive and protective of peoples, individual inquiry begins to disappear. Just as the physical pioneer has no longer a place when nations become highly civilized, so the intellectual pioneer has increasing difficulties as his culture becomes more tightly systematized. Uh, the inducements to see are not as great as they should be, and uh, only criticism may reward the inquisitive individual. In this nation, for example, we have somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 or 160 million human beings. This large collective group is probably more polyglot uh, than most other social integrations which we can examine. When we think of Germany, we think largely of Germans. When we think of England, we think of Englishmen. But when we think of America, we think of Americans, but we know that these Americans come from countless other areas, that they have come here and established their ways of life from a variety of backgrounds. We are also quite uh, obviously convinced that some of these backgrounds linger longer than others. And in most of our large communities, the foreign population groups have it still a tendency to segregate, to remain somewhat to themselves, to preserve their own ways of life. Only a few days ago, for instance, the French people in this community celebrated Bastille Day. And there was something about this that awakened nostalgia in thousands of persons of French descent, even though they may have been born in this country. Thus, we are really a very complicated people, a people with many different cultural patterns, which are not dead, which have not ceased, possibly because America as a nation has never really advanced a powerful culture of its own. These people are left to drift very largely. They maintain their own culture because there is no clear indication of any other pattern to follow. So if we are composed, as we know that we are, of the peoples of more than 150 nations, if our cultures root back to a great many different sources, this is all the more reason why the individual, in whose life stream perhaps a number of foreign courses still flow, that the individual should have the opportunity of finding various inspirational material from different basic sources suitable to his own peculiar needs. In the process also of developing this national pattern, as we call it, we have presented ourselves with a greater complexity of problems than probably any other nation on earth. 
We recognize this in the extreme difficulty that we have in being fair to various people and various social groups. As a national institution, uh, we must adjust all our legislations to the tremendous areas of specialization uh, which exist within this country. Realizing, consequently, that our people are probably subject to more psychic stress in a wider variety of psychic patterns than most other civilizations. We have needs which must be met with larger concepts, with deeper insight, and with a broader recognition of the requirements of the growing individual. Our Western way of life also seems to invite us to a very rapid form of industrial and intellectual growth. Uh, persons in various social strata today are apt to shift about very suddenly. The individual of comparatively slight means and therefore perhaps uh, of slight insight because he has never felt compelled to enlarge his perspective suddenly finds himself a, an administrating power over larger means or finds himself advanced into other levels of his business. The problem of being born, living, and dying in one small pattern has been rather well broken up in this country. So the needs of Monday may be quite different from the needs of Tuesday. And the rapid shift and change in our ways calls upon greater internal resource on our own part so that we may adjust not only externally but internally. For if we do not adjust mentally, morally, psychologically, ethically, and emotionally, our adjustment is not adequate. Where we cannot adjust, we become confused. And the greater the degree of confusion, the more easily uh, we are uh, injured by the things that happen to us. So to find spiritual consolation in this Western world, probably means that we need a broader area of religious understanding than most people have as yet developed. Now some will say, and with a very large degree of uh, accuracy, that essentially all religions teach about the same thing. Therefore we should be able to find in any one of them all the consolation that is necessary to us. In principle, this is probably true. But in activity and in action, we find it is not quite as obviously satisfactory as we might assume. It is true that most faiths teach the same basic essentials. But usually they teach these essentials in a slightly different symbolical pattern. It is not what an institution teaches that is the primary and ultimate problem. It is how the person depending upon that institution is able to interpret for himself what it teaches. Thus individuals of different types of minds are not able to accept one interpretation for all the different uh, principles that arise. We know this. It is no question uh, of acceptance or rejection of a theory. We know this in Christendom alone. But we know that Christianity, to meet the needs of many different individuals, has already become highly sectarian. And that today probably a dozen or twenty major divisions and nearly 500 minor sects uh, disseminate Christian religious doctrine uh, through the peoples of Christendom. Uh, this means that certain interpretations are more or less essential to the individual. He instinctively goes to one that seems to be nearest to his own need. Today the mature selection of religion is much greater than it used to be. In many faiths the individual was born into a doctrine and never conceived the possibility of moving from it. But today there is a greater tendency of mature people to choose their faiths. And in the choice of this nature, a certain power within man is necessary. 
It is again as though you went to a store to buy some products. You are conditioned by your attitudes toward these products. And the thoughtful person tries to find out which products are the best. He may succeed or he may not succeed, but he undoubtedly develops allegiances. We have today probably 20 or 25 different kinds of soaps and detergents for washing machines. Each of these brands has a positive following that will not buy anything else. They do not know why. Each is convinced uh, that that particular brand is a little better than the others. Perhaps they've been told so. Perhaps that's the television program they turn on. But whatever it is, they have this conviction and a wonderful loyalty. And I have wondered sometimes whether all the detergents didn't come from one vat and the only difference was the packaging. But that most people would not admit. And just as they are not certain as to which soap will prove the greatest cleanser, so they may not be quite certain what faith proves the greatest cleanser. Whatever it is, however, they are certain in their own minds that they have a peculiar insight into these problems. Now, as we do have this inevitable tendency of people to develop loyalty to certain ideas, it is rather important for those people and for their own good that these loyalties have certain foundation in fact we are unhappy today because of the numerous loyalties that are not justified or not substantially sustained. So General Furlong tried to help to create a pattern uh, of knowledge by which we could overcome certain basic prejudice and try to establish a religious conviction, perhaps as our ancient forebears did upon some kind of a method of estimation or of evaluation uh, which would help to make things uh, as they should be. So he went back to the very dawn of time uh, when man was an extremely primitive being, perhaps at that mysterious point religionless, without any essential um, way of determining of the spiritual equation in his own life. He moved around probably much uh, as the utter materialist of today, but with fewer faculties and facilities. He lived uh, merely because he had been born, and therefore he had to continue until death relieved him of whatever complications had arisen. He lived by hunting because he had to eat. Gradually, he became aware of the need of clothing to protect himself against the rigors of the world around him. In the course of time, habitation emerged as a necessity, and he began to enlarge the caves and the sides of hills. And little by little, his own internal pressures, the dawn of consciousness within himself, led him to the inevitable selections which have become the foundation of our entire concept of progress. Somewhere in this mystery also, another type of faculty within himself began to emerge. And this faculty probably was not quite the religious power or faculty we know today. It was rather fear or perhaps a strange inquisitiveness, an effort to explain things that could not easily be explained, and also in this process a kind of inferiority complex developed because the individual found himself as a very small being in a very large process of which he was only a fractional part. And in his studies, with his contemplations in these days before he could even make a scratching on a wall to indicate his thoughts, the individual found himself confronted by forces representing various procedures in the world around him. 
One of the uh, forces that he probably discovered at an early time in his contemplation was the sun. This tremendous ball of light and fire which moved daily across the sky and when it departed left behind it the darkness of night in which in due time and course the stars or perhaps the moon uh, became visible to him and took over the management of the nocturnal period of his existence. The sun was a wonderful thing. It was all powerful. These primitive people did not know what it was. They saw merely a great ball of light that seemed to move constantly, which seemed to bring with it the dawn in which the whole world awoke from sleep. This light ball awakened existence. It also gave him the opportunity to go forth and hunt or to perform the various needs which could only be met by him in a period of daylight. You can imagine that to this primitive man, the sun came to be very important. He couldn't control it. He couldn't fathom it. He couldn't reach out and touch it. It was something that went on and on and on. He had his beginnings and his ends, but the sun did not. It kept its pattern age after age always a great light moving through the sky. Well, it would be quite natural and proper for a primitive being, comparatively without reasoning resources, to sense in this thing something wonderful, something beyond his control, something that also seemed to serve him in a wonderful way, for this son was his great friend, although in the desert it could become his enemy. Still, for the most part, it was friendly. It served his needs. It helped him to do things. And it became a symbol of his own survival. And with it went the power of light. And light has become, in the course of time, one of our greatest key thoughts in symbolism and in intellect. We think now of enlightened persons as one who have a kind of light in themselves. And we recognize radiance in a personality as a very wonderful and helpful attribute. So primitive man began to worship the sun. He began to see in it all of the wonders of life. He began to give thanks for it. He began to depend upon it. And to sense that this dependence was the one thing that was real that all other things might fail, but the sun, the moon, and the stars would go on their way. Thus they became a symbol of continuance and seemed to reveal or represent some wonderful orderly process greater than he could, uh, could comprehend. It would be only natural, therefore, for him to bestow upon the sun all of his own attributes and many others until this became a wonderful luminous, radiant being upon whom he could depend continuously for his help in time of trouble, to the ripening of his harvest, to the sprouting of grain. And the sun became a symbol of the life power everywhere present in existence. Now in the course of ages, sun worship gradually refined itself. We do not worship the sun anymore as such, but the elements of sun worship have not ceased in religion. And down through the ages, this great stream of conviction continued, modified, augmented, refined, as our own knowledge increased, and brought into a more complete pattern with the gradual rise of astronomical sciences. Yet with it all, the principle of the sun has come down to us into our modern religion, into our present believing in all things, in the concept of the worship of light, of the principle of light, that light represents the power to penetrate the unknown, and that the light, as St. George, has finally slain the dragon of darkness and of ignorance, 
and light became truth, and darkness became error. And we have always believed that there was a light that lighteth the darkness, and that this light is God. Therefore, we will frequently refer to God as light. And this comes down to us from this old stream of human belief. Now man also exploring around him and estimating the values of things that occurred, it came to another interesting symbol, and that was his instinctive recognition of the mystery of procreation, the power of living things to generate, to reproduce their kind, the little bird breaking through the shell of the egg, the birth of new beings in nature the mysterious process of the continuity of life through generation fascinated primitive man. It seemed that in this some mysterious magical agent was involved, and the worship of generation was early involved in magic. Yet the fact remained that one of the most powerful forces in the universe was that which kept things going kept them reproducing their kind, causing them to grow, causing them to continue, to bring each year the new harvest out of the earth, that things growing from their seed produced in turn their own seed, and that this went on and on and on. So out of the concept of this came a recognition of a universal mystery of procreativity a mystery of life begetting life. And all that had to do with this begetting as it related to man became sacred, became mysterious and wonderful, and was regarded as a gift or a bestowal of some power invisible and superior to man. A little later in his growth, man discovered fire. And we have the rise of the religions of fire. We find the altar flame burning everywhere, whether it was upon the altars of the ancient tribes of Israel or in the burning candles on the altars of the modern church. The worship of fire, all that it meant, all of the mystery that it implied, fire came from nowhere. Fire burned out and died. But although a thousand fires died, fire did not die. Everywhere by a magic power it could be called forth. Everywhere it became either a source of light or of a consuming power. And this mystery of fire, flickering, mysterious, formless, ever-present, this mysterious and strange thing which brought light into the cave where the sun could not reach, which warmed the coldness of winter, and which gradually came to assist in the preparation of food. Fire was a very wonderful thing, and fire to these ancient peoples seemed to represent the presence of a power, the power of heat, the power of warmth. They discovered that when they died, their bodies became cold, that a fire went out of them. And so to many very primitive peoples, there was the belief that a fire burned in the heart of man, and that this fire was his spirit. And the uniting of the concept of spirit and fire gradually gained much favor in the thinkings of primitive peoples. And as a result, uh, we have a pyrolatry, or the worship of the principle of fire and its symbol, which is the upright triangle. Now, while all these things were going on in the thinkings of men, other primitive and original discoveries were also brought to uh, consideration. Another great discovery was the earth. Not the earth just simply because it was a surface upon which primitive man wandered about through forests and jungles and along the shores of lakes and streams, but the earth itself became wonderful. The worship of the earth as the great mother originated at a very remote time. Why? Because man clung to the earth. He held on to it. He tried to have a little part of it for his own home, for his own protection. 
the earth grew his food, and the sense of concept was that he had come himself from the earth, and to the earth he returned again in the grave mound. And in the grave he seemed to go back into the earth, and therefore the grave became a gateway leading down somewhere under the earth where there might be a place where ghosts and shadows lived. But the earth became, in a sense, the source of all nutrition, the, the security, the firmness beneath our feet, the very source of our ability to survive at all. As a planet, it was not known to these people, but as an element, they could take it in their hands and allow the rich, dark soil to fall through their fingers. They also saw the roots of plants clinging desperately to the earth for life. They saw the rain of making the earth fertile. And from it all came this wonderful veneration for the great earth principle, the mother of mysteries, from whose eternal womb all life came and into the darkness of which all life in turn went back uh, when its course was finished. The earth became therefore a model of temple and house and of prison and of graveyard. It was all these different things. But as a principle, earth remained. And gradually as man grew a little wiser, he bound the concept of his own body with the earth. His body was made of the substances of the earth, and it was sustained by the source of its own substances. So the worship of earth, or of nature particularly, and all natural phenomena, took a large place in man's thinking. And at one time the Egyptians had a deity, Serapis, to signify this wonderful world of nature. And at Alexandria, where his shrine stood, they had a great image of him, and this image was composed entirely of natural things. The body was made up of grain and fruit and flowers, and all living creatures were wound into this mysterious emblem, which thereby became a symbol of nature itself. So we have these beginning streams which men in their own concept felt to be important. Now, one thing that man recognized also was the rapidity with which all things seem to pass away. Things change and disappear, and they are no more. And among those things that went was man himself. And the great god of Babylonia cried out, Let me be remembered. And this desire to be remembered uh, perhaps based upon the lingering memory that man had of his own forebears. He liked to remember his father, and his father would tell of his grandfather. And this man then did not want to be forgotten. He wanted his children to tell of him, and their children in turn to tell, turn to tell of their grandfather, and so on. So in the cries of the ancient cuneiform inscriptions of Babylonia and Chaldea, the uh, thought is constantly implied, let us not be forgotten. Let some part of us belong to that which never shall die. A man looking around for the symbol of this hope of endurance found two elements working together. He found that with his own hand he could make little carvings little tracings with a hard rock upon a softer one, in which he could make pictures telling about himself, telling about the world he lived in. And these pictures he made upon the surface of enduring rock. And out of the recombination and psychology of the idea that rock became the source of recording, that that which was to endure endured longest upon rock, and out of this came the rock inscription, uh, the gradual carving of glyphs that we can no longer read, but which in their own time meant something. They meant survival. They meant that memory would go on remembering, and that the children on the rock picture could trace the doings of their ancestors. So the worship of stone 
the worship of great monolithic rocks raised in circles as at Stonehenge or at Karnak in Brittany or out in the jungles of Africa or Asia. These rocks were, were the symbol of endurance, things that would go on and would never die. And out of this came the worship of stone and of stone monuments and of obelisks and the building of pyramids and all of these great rock projects. They were created to the concept of immortality, to the fact that something would go on. So even today, men follow this instinctively, whether they realize it or not. A few days ago, happening to be down near the Civic Center, I saw one of these great demolishing machines hurling an iron ball against the wall of a building that was slowly crumbling. This building had evidently at one time been an heroic endeavor in the construction of our city. They had not yet torn down or demolished the entrance door, a kind of semi-Grecian arch that uh, perhaps showed more of courage than of architectural skill, but over the door was a man's name. This building was the building he had built. In a few more minutes, this great iron ball would lower this with the rest. And this project, which had stood maybe 50 or 75 years in memory of this man who had built it, would be laid with the dust of ages. But the man had put his name there just exactly for the same reason that our primitive ancestor carved circles, squares, and galloping bison upon the wall of a cave. He did it to be remembered. It was his little bid to immortality. Perhaps he had had to practically burden his own soul in order to get the funds to build this building. It was his monument. It was also his grave marker. And now time was to take it away. But his instinct was there, this instinct never to die, to be remembered through the things we do. And this is still an essential part of our religion. Today we perhaps use it differently. We do not make so much of the stone. Perhaps rather today we try to mold our names and superscriptions upon the hearts of our children. We try to hope that they will carry on the careers that we leave unfinished. We build great enterprises as the ancients built their monuments in stone. And we hope that those who come after us will always remember that this vast project was originally created by some one person, that this person, John Doe, should never be forgotten. So it goes. And this monument problem, this tracing of things in stone as a symbol of permanence, resulted in the worship of stone. And it did become a great faith in ancient times, as is referred to in the Bible by the monument that was set up in Egypt. And wherever a great people has flourished, it has carved its records deep into stone, whether it is the Roman Forum or the Egyptian complex at Karnak or in the Great Wall of China or in the pagodas of Japan or the mosques of Islam. Always there is the name, the word, the inscription that must go on. The worship of stone, therefore, became a symbol of the worship of memory. It became the not to forget that which is the source of ourselves, that which has helped to build or to make possible the continuance of our own way of life. Again, the ancients in their studies and researches became aware of something else. This something else that they became aware of was motion. Vitality moved into their concept, gradually taking over a greater part than had previously been recognized. That which belongs to the animal or human way of life is most alive when it moves. The ancients considered sleep a kind of death, a thought which is carried into the Bible in the words of St. Paul. But motion was everywhere present. 
Motion as a power was not visible. To the ancients, motion was perhaps most clearly and universally recognized by the motion of air, wind. The wind was a very mysterious thing, but it seemed as though it was something like the motion of God through things. God walked by and the trees moved. You couldn't see what moved them, but they moved. And man felt the cold breath of wind upon his face, or the hot and heated winds of the desert, which was the breath of Typhon, the destroyer. But always air was the breath of God, or the motion of God through things. The man began to sense that some things moved of themselves. Others were moved by an outside and mysterious power. And gradually he became aware of another motion, a motion he called destiny. How all things are moved by a mysterious, invisible moral force to an end some way predestined and foreordained. And the ancient, looking everywhere for a perfect symbol of motion, became aware also of cyclic motion the motions of the sun, and of the moon, and of the stars, the motion of seasons. And he realized that motion was more than merely reaching out your hand. Motion was a great movement in space. Though he didn't know much about space, and he knew less about movement. As late as the time of the Incas of Peru, they worshipped their god when the wind went by by kissing the air. They believed that there was something there that was moving all these things. And they were not, of course, privileged to enjoy our knowledge of high and low, blood, uh, low pressure areas. And as a result of that, they were not able to make nearly as many mistakes in calculating the weather as we do now. But in any event, in their primitive minds, life was motion. And they bestowed motion upon many things we would not incline to think about. For instance, today, if we lose a pair of cufflinks, we know we've mislaid it. Ancient man, if he lost something, decided it moved away. This was perfectly reasonable to his thinking. So he allowed many inanimate objects to have power of motion. And in dreams, he was able to even conceive of trees walking. He was able to have many of these thoughts which are also carried, some of them, in the story of the Inferno by Dante. But he wanted a symbol that would some way represent the beauty, the wonder, the mystery of rhythm, of motion, and of movement. And he looked around him for something that seemed to embody this quality or these qualities more than anything else. And what he found was the serpent. And out of this came the worship of the serpent, the symbol of pure motion. Here was something that moved without feet, yet it had a body and a form. And its motion was always a strange undulating rhythm. And all over the world the serpent symbol appeared, like the seven-headed Nagas of Cambodia and the great serpent upon which Vishnu swept through the seven eternities. Here was the winged serpent of the ancient lands of the Euphrates, Euphrates, the serpent raised by Moses in the wilderness. And even as late as the time of Jesus, he admonished his disciples to be as wise as serpents and as harmless as doves. The serpent gradually came to be a symbol of life motion. And from this life motion and all of its implications, there gradually came the concept of wisdom. This secondary concept, however, was due to the acceptance by the priesthood of the serpent symbol of life. In ancient times, the wise ones were the priests. Their symbols, in turn, became symbols of knowledge and of wisdom. And the pharaoh of Egypt placed the coiled serpent upon his forehead as a symbol of his authority. When the white-robed priests of Memphis carried their serpent-wound staffs, it was only time before the symbol of motion or vitality should also become the symbol of learning because it was traced upon the doors of ancient schools and colleges. It was the symbol of penetration, of realization, of deepness of insight. 
tracing itself back again, of course, to another attribute of deity. It is still the symbol of the medical profession. Why? Because the symbol is motion. Motion is life, and motion opposes death, which is inertia. Therefore, a motion symbol is a life symbol. And it is the duty of this serpent to symbolize, therefore, the victory of the animate power over the problem of death, which is the loss of animation. And it was first found wound around the staff of Asclepius, the great Greek deity of medicine. So the serpent became, became a symbol. Motion was life, life was protection, life was continuance. Life was the guarding of things, and among the ruins of our Mayan brethren to the south, the gods and heroes stand protected by the serpent glyph in the air above them. And the winged serpent came, the serpent of the mysteries, of initiations and of secret rites. And the, and the subterranean temples of Ebalba, as described in the great uh, work, the Popol Vuh, the sacred book of the Kichi of Central America, the temples were the serpent holes that went under the earth. The serpent, therefore, gradually gained its place, not as a symbol of evil, but as a symbol of life, evil only by the misuse of life. That the very principle of life itself tempts men to destroy, tempts men to pervert or misuse. And that which is the greater good is also the potential cause of the greatest ill. So the serpent became one of the great archetypal symbols of religion. And we can go on with these basic symbols, one after another, but one perhaps more would be sufficient to carry our thought. Man studying man also made certain discoveries, and these discoveries in turn uh, were affected psychologically by a series of other factors. Gradually there arose in early society a tribal kind of existence. A tribe must have a chieftain. It must have someone to lead. For from a very early time man realized that all men could not lead. And there had to emerge the strong one, the hero. And in time, this heroic descent became a fixed pattern. Probably at the beginning and even later in some areas, chief, the chieftain was elected. But it gradually became an hereditary prerogative. But the tribe was ruled by the powerful one. And if he was not powerful enough in his own estate to gain the necessary recognition, he was given various attributes. He was permitted to wear a certain special raiment of authority. He wore more ornamentation, more jewels, more crowns than other men. He had a larger house to live in, which gradually became a palace. But by degrees, even though he might still be only a human being, he was surrounded by defenses and props, by means of which he became separated more and more from the other members of his clan until he gained the mysterious psychological aura of authority. I know in years ago, when you could still go to Peking, I saw there in the Imperial Museum the coronation armors of the Emperor of China. These armors were of solid chain gold. And uh, the Emperor, when it came time to put on his full coronation regalia, was not physically able to carry its weight. Therefore, he was seated on his throne. A device like a tea cross was placed behind him on the level of his shoulders, and his robes were draped on that and over him. He could not carry the weight of his own robes. This shows what has happened and what does occur in the effort to make the individual seem different, to seem more important than before. Today, we do not bother to put a heavy robe over the front of him, or a T-square or a cross behind him to sustain it, all we need to do is pin on his chest, his bank book, and everyone worships of their own accord. But anyway, that is the way it was in old times. And in the course of time, the cults were no longer so clearly differentiated. The tree worshippers or the earth worshippers came closer to the fire worshippers. Those to whom the sun was the great symbol, 
met and mingled their culture with those to whom the serpent was the great symbol. And in the course of thousands of years, these different streams formed a vast and elaborate chemistry of interrelationships. And as people grew wiser, the relationships were no longer merely of emblems. It wasn't merely that we swapped fetishes. The meanings behind the emblems mingled along with the physical symbols themselves. And a faith that had only one essential symbol suddenly realized that there was more than one and either added its attributes to their own symbol or accepted uh, the two symbols, as in the case of the raising of the brazen serpent, where according to the ancient records, Moses raised the serpent upon the T-cross of the Egyptians. Here two symbols, originally far separate, met for the first time, perhaps, among these people. But the thoughts mingled also, and by degrees, compounds were created. First two symbols met, releasing a new and larger religious content. These two in the course of time, having met, perhaps broke again because the cement was not strong enough, and went on for a time isolated, each however with a certain borrowing from the other. Then in turn these separated ones mingled with others that had met and separated. And so gradually, this tremendous chemistry of the interrelating of basic concepts have resu resulted in the emergence of the seven great religions known to the ancients. Some of these have not survived, but in the original pattern, these religions became the vast institution each of which brought together into some suitable pattern for its own purpose the heritage of man's basic spiritual convictions. The symbols, of course, always were the emblems of these convictions. And the more of them mingled, the more complete became man's concept of deity. Because once to one stream, perhaps, deity was almost solely the concept of generation. To another, however, it was almost entirely the concept of endurance or physical survival. Others, in turn, saw in it light or warmth. So when light and warmth met, intellectualism became illumined with mysticism. The old symbols got their deeper insights. And we no longer would like to believe that we are sun worshippers. We are, whether we know it or not. We would not like to believe that we are fire worshippers, but we are. The instincts and principles have never ceased. We may not want to feel that we are depending upon rock for the survival of our memories, but we do in many ways. Because the main principle is we all want to be remembered. And this be releases the principles. We no longer worship the symbol of motion, but there is really no difference between that and the peculiar feeling we get at the pit, at the pit of the stomach when we talk about atomic fission. It is the same principle. We are dealing with energy, power, mind, generation, law, we are dealing with these great concepts that have flowed downward into the faiths of the day. Now anyone who studies religion, and this is not necessarily any reference directly to our faith, anyone who studies religion is exposed to comparative religion. I have known persons associated with many religions who have taken large advantage of the privileges and opportunities of their own faiths. And it is quite a mistake to assume that other religions are not aware of the comparative factors. I know I discussed this once with a very well-enlightened and well-instructed Muslim. Now, the Muslim is a very devout person to his own faith, and he is not inclined easily to stray from it. 
But he was perfectly frank to say that the old scholar that instructed him, and of course in the Muslim faith the priest is a teacher rather than a preacher, uh, the old scholar who instructed him clearly indicated how these symbols had come down from Egypt and Chaldea and from all the mysterious parts of the world of ancient times. There was no hesitance in this and uh, was perfectly willing to comment thoughtfully upon comparative religion. The same is true in Buddhism. An educated Buddhist perhaps will know as much about Christianity as the average Christian. We do not realize it, but it is common fact. We judge these things not by the scholar, but by the average person who may not know too much about his own faith and therefore not much about anyone else's. But the fact remains that all religions of importance in the world today do teach comparative religion. Sometimes they teach it in order to try to emphasize the superiority of their own. Sometimes, however, they are pretty honest in their effort to understand uh, the uh, various streams of belief that have contributed to make man's faith as it is today. So we cannot say definitely that the study of comparative religion is essentially wrong. A number of very brilliant uh, scholars in comparative religion have arisen in Christianity. Some of the most brilliant have also been Catholic priests. But they are not to be confused with the average believers in these things who are not equipped with this particular or specific type of research instinct. But the information is available. And it is not impossible for the average person to work with it if he wants to. Out of these problems there will arise one very practical thought one that we do need, and we need it badly. Comparative religion has unfolded very critically and very consistently in the great chart of General Furlong. Comparative religion is one of the answers uh, to the problem of world unification today. Today we may judge the population of the world largely by its religious uh, factors. So let us say that for the moment the world has a population of between two and a quarter and two and a half billion human beings. Figures sort of fluctuate a little bit around two billion four hundred million. Of this group, uh, in round for terms, Christianity has a following of approximately eight hundred million. Of this 800 million, there are several denominations. Probably the Catholic Church leads with about 450 million. Protestantism with about 200 million following. The Eastern Church, including the Greek Orthodox and Russian Church, about 150 million. In addition to this, there are a number of smaller groups. Again, in this pattern also, we have Muslimism with a following of approximately 350 million. Buddhism with an approximate following of 500 million. Hinduism with an approximate following of 300 million. This leaves us one of the largest areas involved, China. The religious situation there is pretty difficult to clarify at the moment but we have a population of about 600 million divided into a number of religious groups of which three are dominant Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism and no one knows just how much inroad modern thinking has made upon these groups but probably potentially psychologically and archetypally the Chinese consciousness has not changed uh, so completely as to destroy all religious valuation and probably two-thirds of the Chinese are still addicted to some strong philosophical moral or cultural code above politics now when we get through with adding this together and not allowing very much for primitive peoples who still worship their lairs and panates we still have a rather interesting discovery to make that on the t statistics available it is rather doubtful if more than 5% of the Earth's population is either agnostic or atheistic. 
This is rather an interesting discovery. In fact, if we add together all the followings, we have more than the total population, but we have to be a little bit conservative and also realize that in some faiths, following is by birth, by other faiths, following is by allegiance at maturity, so that it is a little difficult to estimate all of these factors adequately. But we do know that the majority of the religions of the world represent emphasis. Emphasis upon certain streams of concept that have descended from these primitive patterns that by this time all of them have been admixtured with all others so that no actually clear line of demarcation is actually possible. If we are surprised and concerned over cultural fusion, we must also be prepared to accept religious fusion, for it has happened. We cannot differentiate today any religious group and say that it has been unconditioned or untouched by any other religious group. So that uh, today most religions, whether they know it or not, are to a measure comparative. I remember, as I think I've told you before, discussing this with the ecumenical patriarch Athenagoras of the Eastern Church. And he very frankly told me, he said, of course, our rituals, our sacraments, our rites, everything practically we have came from Egypt. We know that. In other words, there is no doubt of the descent of these lines of religious worship. If we removed the Christian factor from Islam, we'd have very little left. If we removed the Jewish factor, factor from Christianity, we'd have a very large hole. If we removed Hinduism from Buddhism, again, we would make a very serious scar in the structure as it now exists. And we have other faiths such as Shintoism, the doctrines of the Jains and the Sikhs. We have many other religions, each of which is to a measure dependent upon the others. So we are fighting a losing fight, consciously and intellectually, when we try to isolate religions and try to assume uh, that there is nothing to be gained from a comparative study of their philosophies. A great deal to be gained. Let us take the average person today who has certain needs. Now we can say without question that almost any one of the major religions of the world could supply most of the ordinary spiritual consolations required by the needs of the average person. This is true. But at the same time, there are reasons why this is not effective in operation. To some persons, the elaborate symbolisms of the past are frightening. To other individuals, that which is strange or different is in itself uh, an adversary. We are afraid of what is not familiar to us. It isn't possible in operation for us to be quite as interdenominational as we might wish to be psychologically. But today modern man has many problems and uh, his problems are hereditary. We can say for example that Western civilization is perhaps 5,000 years old counting most of the streams of the Greco-Egyptian culture lying behind it might be 7,000 years old. We won't bicker over a couple of thousand years. But we are faced with problems now that have been already assailed or integrated by other peoples. For instance, in the West, we have been a very progressive, active culture. Europe, America has been always on the move. Now we are confronted with a problem of there's not much more place to move to. This presents another situation. Up to now, we've always walked out on a bad situation by moving into new territory. Now there is no new territory, and we are confronted with the desperate difficulty of staying where we are in the middle of the situation. We can't get out of it anymore. Now, we haven't much psychological background to face this with. It has not been our way of life. Theoretically, our faiths should cover it. And in a measure, in principle, they do. But when we are in a specialized dilemma, we generally look for a specialized solution. We can say, for example, that in problems of living, grandfather's wisdom should be enough. 
And in all problems, we should go to grandfather who has lived longer and say, now look, how would we handle this? But our tendency today is to doubt the wisdom of this procedure. If we are in legal difficulties, we go to a lawyer, not grandfather, because we recognize there are problems now that grandfather doesn't understand very well. He lived in another generation. If we get sick, we are not inclined to depend upon grandfather's uh, ancient knowledge of botany. We begin to look for something else. If we decide to buy real estate, we are not going to depend on grandfather. We're going to try and find an expert. We're going to find someone who has specialized in this procedure. So in our religious needs today, we have a world to choose from of peoples who have specialized various aspects of their own spiritual needs. As we get older and become a little more introverted and have to sit on the ancient territory uh, a little more tightly than ever before, perhaps we will find more consolation in the wisdom of China than we will in our own particular treatment of philosophy. Where China is an old and patient culture that has gone through as much more corruption than we have ever known and is still psychologically striving with the problem of helping the Chinese as an individual to live with himself. And he's had an awful lot of experience in it. We also begin to wonder whether our artistry or our uh, various cultures are as helpful as they should be. We look at our architecture, it kind of makes us half sick. We look at our painting, that makes us entirely sick. And we begin to say, what has happened to beauty in our Western world? And then out of another country and out of another religion, Buddhism through Zen into Japan and Korea comes this concept of Shibui, the, prop the propriety of things. Now, the principles of Zen are in Christianity, but we've never done anything with them. But another people with another problem took that angle of the problem and worked on it. They made it work for them. Now, we could do the same. We could start from scratch and build also. But it's almost too inviting to find another person or another group that is accomplished in these areas. Therefore, our tendency is to move into what they have accomplished and try to adapt it for our own need. This isn't heresy. This is common sense. And so we go among other people of the world. Some races have gone far in art, some in music, some in literature. Some religions have given us great spiritual consolation. Others have stimulated great mental thoughtfulness. And so we have a wonderful heritage of beliefs today. And out of this wonderful heritage must ultimately be revealed what seems to me to be the basic problem involved. Uh, just as recent researches in philology have indicated that there was a mother language beneath all the tongues of earth, that we are all speaking dialects of a basic language now forgotten. I think we may also say that there is a basic religion, a blazing star of spiritual beginnings, uh, perhaps represented in part at least by Furlong's wonderful mingling of the rivers of faith but that there has been from the beginning a religion, an eternal, universal, unchanging spiritual principle, that the essential ideals surrounding this core religion, like the petals of a flower, or in Eastern thought, the beautiful flowering of the lotus, that these basic beliefs and ideas form together with their central core one magnificent religious concept that this concept has slowly broken up by the processes of involutionary motion. It has been divided and scattered and tossed about throughout the world. The seeds have fallen on all kinds of ground, and due to the different kinds of soil, they have grown to be slightly different. But uh, while not perhaps immediately recognizable, they are essentially the same. Gradually, by our evolutionary process, the demand of our spiritual culture for totality, all of these fragments must be gathered together again. The broken up streams of religion must be reunited. The great pattern of religious motion which we have known is one great movement based upon an utter human need, upon a complete dependence of man upon ideal truth and principle for survival. 
and in this world of confusion as it we now know it, I have always felt that religious confusion is the most tragic of all, because it means that we have not achieved that degree of insight in which we can unite the best part of ourselves for the solution of common problems. While we are not able to unite our understanding of God, while we are not able to unite our archetypal concept of the purpose for existence, or the essential unity of life, or the inevitability of law, or the glory and splendor of the unfoldment of one plan to one purpose, while these visions are deficient in us, our spiritual potential is unable to exercise its directive at this time when it is so decidedly necessary. Through comparative religion, however, some of the pressures of prejudice and barriers of creed will inevitably uh, be broken down. As soon as we are able to even study together, think together, plan together, in our search for religious value, we will attain a great deal. But whereas at now our religious unity is lagging behind the dream of political unity, actually our religious unity and our spiritual core understanding should lead all other phases of our culture. That which is most important must come first and must also be the directive over all else. The only directives that we have that are adequate are directives based upon such principles as the uh, Decalogue of Moses or the Sermon on the Mount or the uh, famous disciplines and commandments of Buddhism or the essential moral code of Vyasa or the great ethical code of Confucius. These are the codes upon which the unities of peoples can be logically and reasonably established. These codes in themselves are compatible. In fact, they are practically identical. And if we go far enough into the heart of a religion, we find the common religion of mankind. But we haven't gone far enough. We have been content to do the same thing with religion that we have done with most other departments of our society. To specialize it, to departmentalize it, to accept progress in the terms of division rather than readdition. Therefore, we regard ourselves as advancing because we break up knowledge into smaller segments and examine these segments more intensively. Actually, what we need is to bring these segments together and examine the unity more intensively. If we can de remove from the average person's life his religious uncertainties or his uh, religious intolerances, if we can release his energy from the level of religious criticism, uh, more to be used for the terms of the advancement of the common good of man, we could escape from the loss of energy re uh, resulting from continual division and antagonism. And this division and antagonism is of no practical value to us now and hasn't been from the beginning, only we didn't realize it. As we must be a united world today to achieve the survival of our way of life, we must also realize that what we call our way of life is, an, is essentially an extension into politics of our moral conviction. And our moral conviction, in turn, is an extension into morality of our spiritual foundation. Therefore, our way of life is essentially an expression of our religion. If we can unite our spiritual conviction, we can help to unite our way of life, to bring together all the energies and resources that are now wasted in a kind of moral, intellectual, or spiritual feudalism. We are past this stage. We are up to the time of the need for the bringing together in sincere friendship all human beings of good intention, of kindly purpose, and of spiritual insight. This means that also in ourselves, each of us must take the several religious selves that, makes up, that make up our personality, the various conflicts of religion, morality, and ethics in our own natures, 
These must be reconciled. They must be brought together so that in the life of each person, the best in him guides the rest. If he can achieve this, his own religious position will be clear. And he will realize what men have always known who were thoughtful. Namely, that man's searching for truth from the beginning, by his own very nature, the ultimates can only be ultimately known. The search for truth today is not to be a battle of persons who believe they have found all the answers. The search for truth today is an honest realization that out of unity, cooperation, and the continuance of all good things, man is gradually growing up to the condition in which he can know the answer. So today, almost all of our uh, bigotries and prejudices are wars of opinion, for man as yet cannot experience the full mystery of religion. But he can and has been able to demonstrate that to the degree that he brings peace in his own life, his religious principles have a better chance. And to the degree that through religion he can bring peace to society, to the nations and faiths of the world, to the degree that they become friendly and peaceful, to that degree they are in a better condition to advance their own insight and to unite in the common improvement of the world. I feel, therefore, that through comparative religion we can remove one great source of energy waste, and that is sectarianism, and come finally to an appreciation of the spiritual in integrities of those of all faiths and gain a willingness to use truth wherever we can find it, for it is truth that will correct error. And if we reject a part of truth, we perpetuate a part of error. So from a quiet study of all of these facts and values, I think we do get a little better foundation on which to build our own attitudes for the world of the future, uh, which will need and must have a spiritual guidance that is firmer and truer and deeper than that which is available today. Time's up.